while the light lasts. The Ford car bumped from rut to rut and the hot African sun poured down unmercifully. On either side of the so-called road stretched an unbroken line of trees and scrub, rising and falling in gently undulating lines as far as the eye could reach, the colouring a soft, deep yellow-green, the whole effect languorous and strangely quiet. Few birds stirred the slumbering silence. Once a snake wriggled across the road in front of the car, escaping the driver's efforts at destruction with sinuous ease. Once a native stepped out from the bush, dignified and upright, behind him a woman with an infant bound closely to her broad back and a complete household equipment including a frying pan balanced magnificently on her head all these things george crozier had not failed to point out to his wife who had answered him with a monosyllabic lack of attention which irritated him thinking of that fellow he deduced wrathfully it was thus that he was wont to allude in his own mind to Diadris Crozier's first husband, killed in the first year of the war. Killed, too, in the campaign against German West Africa. And because Agatha Christie's stories have so much sort of historical references to them, it makes very important reading for all history students as well, besides everybody else, just for recreation and for multiple other purposes. Natural, she would, perhaps. He stole a glance at her, her fairness, the pink and white smoothness of her cheek, the rounded lines of her figure, rather more rounded, perhaps, than they had been, in those far-off days when she had passively permitted him to become engaged to her, and then, in that first emotional scare of war, had abruptly cast him aside and made a war wedding of it, with that lean, sunburnt boy lover of hers, Tim Nugent. Well, well. The fellow was dead, gallantly dead, and he, George Crozier, had married the girl he had always meant to marry. She was fond of him too. How could she help it when he was ready to gratify her every wish and had the money to do it too? He reflected with some complacency on his last gift to her. At Kimberley, where, owing to his friendship with some of the directors of De Beers, he had been able to purchase a diamond, which in the ordinary way would not have been in the market, a stone not remarkable as to size, but of a very exquisite and rare shade, a peculiar deep amber, almost old gold, a diamond such as you might not find in a hundred years. And the look in her eyes when he gave it to her, women were all the same about diamonds. The necessity of holding on with both hands to prevent himself being jerked out brought George Crozier back to the realities. He cried out for perhaps the fourteenth time with the, un with the pardonable irritation not unpardonable, pardonable irritation of a man who owns two Rolls Royce cars and who had exercised his stud on the highways of civilization. Good Lord, what a car, what a road. He went on angrily. Where the devil is this tobacco estate anyway? It's over an hour since we left Bulaville. Lost in Rhodesia, said the Adre lightly between two involuntary leaps into the air. 
but the coffee colored driver appealed to responded with the cheering news that their destination was just round the next bend of the road the manager of the estate mr walters was waiting on the step to receive them with the touch of deference due to george crozier's prominence in union tobacco he introduced his daughter-in-law who shepherded the diadre through the cool dark inner hall to a bedroom beyond that she could remove the veil with which she was always careful to shield her complexion when motoring as she unfastened the pins in her usual leisurely graceful fashion the adri's eyes swept round the whitewashed ugliness of the bare room no luxuries here and the adri who loved comfort as a cat loves cream shivered a little on the wall a text on the wall a text uh just a minute mhm confronted her on the wall a text confronted her it's a very beautiful paragraph and i got lost in the construction of the sentences so beautiful right and the white i um, comforted her what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul it demanded of all and sundry and the adre pleasantly conscious that the question had nothing to do with her ronned to accompany her shy and rather silent guide she noted but not in the least maliciously the spreading hips and the unbecoming cheap cotton gown and with a glow of quiet appreciation her eyes dropped to the exquisite costly simplicity of her own french white linen beautiful clothes specially when worn by herself roused in her the joy of the artist the two men were waiting for her it won't bore you to come round to mrs crozier not at all I've never been a tobacco factory. I've never been over a tobacco factory. They stepped out into the still rhodesian afternoon. These are the seedlings here. We plant them out as required. You see? The manager's voice drone drawn interpolated by her husband's sharp staccato questions. output stamp duty problems of colored labor she ceased to listen this was rhodesia this was the land tim had loved where he and she were to have gone together after the war was over if he had not been killed as always the bitterness of revolt surged up in her at that thought two short months that was all they had had two months of happiness if that mingled rupture and pain were happiness was love ever happiness did not a thousand tortures beset the lover's heart she had lived intensely in the short space but had she ever known the peace the leisure the quiet contentment of her present life and for the first time she admitted somewhat unwillingly that perhaps all had been for the best i wouldn't have liked living out here i might i mightn't have been able to make him happy i might have disappointed him George loves me and I'm very fond of him and he's very very good to me. Why? Look at the diamond he bought me only the other day. And thinking of it her eyelids dropped a little in pure pleasure. This is where we thread the leaves.
Walters led the way into a low, long shed. On the floor were vast heaps of green leaves and white-clad black boys squatted round them, picking and rejecting with deft fingers, sorting them into sizes and stringing them by means of primitive needles on a long line of string. They worked with a cheerful leisureliness, jesting amongst themselves and showing their white teeth as they laughed. Now, out here, they passed through the shed into the daylight again where the lines of leaves hung drying in the sun. The Adra sniffed delicately at the faint, almost imperceptible fragrance that filled the air. Walters led the way into other sheds where the tobacco kissed by the sun into faint yellow discoloration underwent its further treatment. Dark here, with the brown swinging mosses above, ready to fall to powder at a rough touch. The fragrance was stronger, almost overpowering, it seemed to Deirdre, and suddenly a sort of terror came upon her, a fear of she knew not what that drove her from that menacing, scented obscurity out into the sunlight. Crozier noted her pallor. What's the matter, my dear? Don't you feel well? The sun, perhaps, better not come with us round the plantations, eh? Walters was solicitous. Mrs. Crozier had better go back to the house and rest. He called to a man a little distance away. Mr. Arden, Mrs. Crozier. Mrs. Crozier is feeling a little done up with the heat, Arden. Just take her back to the house, will you? The momentary feeling of dizziness was passing. Deadry walked by Arden's side. She had as yet hardly glanced at him. Deadry, her heart gave a leap and then stood still. Only one person had ever spoken her name like that, with a faint stress on the first syllable that made of it a caress. She turned and stared at the man by her side. He was burnt almost black by the sun. He walked with a limp and on the cheek nearer hers was a long scar which altered his expression. But she knew him. Tim. For an eternity, it seemed to her, they gazed at each other, mute and trembling. And then, without knowing how or why, they were in each other's arms. Tim, time rolled back for them. Then they drew apart again, and Riadri, conscious as she put it of the idiocy of the question, said, Then you're not dead. No, they must have mistaken another chap for me. I was badly knocked on the head, but I came to and managed to crawl into the bush. After that, I don't know what happened for months and months, but a friendly tribe looked after me, and at last I got my proper wits again and managed to get back to civilization. He paused. I found you'd been married six months. Deirdre cried out. Oh, Tim, I understand. Please understand. It was so awful, the loneliness and the poverty. I didn't mind being poor with you, but when I was alone, I hadn't the nerve to stand up against the sordidness of it all. It's all right, Deirdre. I did understand. I know you always have had a hankering after the flesh parts. I took you from them once, but the second time, well, my nerve failed. I was pretty badly broken up. You see, could hardly walk without a crutch, and then there was the scar. She interrupted him passionately. Do you think I would have cared for that? No, I know you wouldn't. 
I was a fool. Some women did mind, you know. I made up my mind I'd managed to get a glimpse of you if you looked happy. If I thought you were contented to be with Crozier, why then I'd remain dead? I did see you. You were just getting into a big car. You had on some lovely sable furs, things I'd never be able to give you if I worked my fingers to the bone. And well, you seemed happy enough. I had in the same strength and courage, the same belief in myself that I'd had before the war. All I could see was myself, broken and useless, barely able to earn enough to keep you. And you looked so beautiful, the address, such a queen amongst women. So worthy to have furs and jewels and lovely clothes and all the hundred and one luxuries Crozier could give you. That and well, the pain of seeing you together decided me. Everyone believed me dead. I would stay dead. The pain repeated Deirdre in a low voice. Well, damn it all, Deirdre, it hurt. It isn't that I blame you, I don't. But it hurt. They were both silent. Then Tim raised her face to his and kissed it with a new tenderness. But that's all over now, sweetheart. The only thing to decide is how we are going to break it to Crozier. Oh, she drew herself away abruptly. I hadn't thought she broke off as Crozier and the manager appeared round the angle of the park. With a swift turn of the head, she whispered, Do nothing now. Leave it to me. I must prepare him. Where could I meet you tomorrow? Nugent reflected. I could come in to Bulaville. How about the cafe near the Standard Bank? At three o'clock, it would be pretty empty. Theodre gave a brief nod of assent before turning her back on him and joining the other two men. Tim Nugent looked after her with a faint frown. Something in her manner puzzled him.